He's over on mass slaughter right here. You disgusting imperialist. You are nothing but a disgusting imperialist. You know. You will. Yep. 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 Every class, David. Every class, David. Every. Don't worry. Come on, bring it on. Betray us out of beauty. 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 That's betray us. He's a war criminal. He's a war criminal. He's a war criminal. You deserve to be clowned! What you doing in our school? You should get out of our school system. You don't belong here. He's just a nothing but a war criminal. Disgust me! You should be ashamed of yourself, goddammit! We're back. David Petraeus, the once uh, lionized general turned CIA director, resigned last month after it was revealed he had been engaged in an extramarital affair with his biographer, Paula Broadwell. Well, today, the Washington Post on the front page reports on another scandal, albeit this one not involving sex. It has to do with the incredible access some friends of his were given while Petraeus was running the war in Afghanistan. The friends were two civilians. Fred and Kimberly Kagan, prominent neoconservative analysts. They were provided desks, email access, and top security clearance to pour through intelligence reports. According to the Post, the four-star general made the Kagan's de facto senior advisors a status that afforded them numerous private meetings in his office, priority travel across the war zone, and the ability to read highly secretive transcripts of intercepted Taliban communications. Even Fred Kagan acknowledged to the Post the arrangement was, quote, strange and uncomfortable at times. Rajiv Chandra, Chandra Sakran wrote in today's story in the Post. And David Korn is the Washington bureau chief for Mother Jones and, of course, an MSNBC political analyst. Rajiv, thanks for that great report. I love it when you make news. Holy cow, I was about to say when I read the Post front page today. As a student, in a very negative way of the Iraq war, who's always suspected anybody who pushed that war was pushing an agenda that wasn't necessarily for a good cause, uh, the Kagans, Robert Kagan, Fred Kagan, Kimberly Kagan, were prominently featured on your newspaper all the time pushing the latest neocon war. Now we find out they're in bed with General Petraeus, who reports to Commander-in-Chief Barack Obama. How did they get inside when they were from the other side ideologically because Chris four-star generals have a lot of leeway when they're out halfway around the world look this arrangement wasn't well known at the White House at the Pentagon by senior officials of the Obama administration certainly if they knew uh, they would have objected um, uh, the, the the extraordinary access that the Kagan's got uh, Petraeus was was able to do much of this just uh, because he was the general and uh, managed to get uh, uh, what, what I understand uh, uh, his lawyers to sign off on on, uh, on the arrangement, which, you know, th they got these desks, they got the security clearance, they traveled around the war zone, they got FaceTime with him regularly, um, uh, very influential Who's he punch of? there. Who's Petraeus all, all of? That. Who is he of? Well, who are his people? Is he part of the neocon crowd? Is he one of them, those people no. that pushed this into their, uh, uh, let's put it this way, heavily encouraged the war in Iraq? Or is he part of the American, uh, the more progressive stream of the presidents, which is very skeptical about these foreign interventions? Which, which oh, world does he come? Is Petraeus part of them, part of the political other side, if you will? Well, I don't think Petraeus neatly fits in the world of the neocons, but he certainly is is a individual who believes in the trans, you know, formative power of the military. The, the yeah. Kagans were very helpful to him with with the uh, intellectual architecture of the surge in Iraq. Um, they they uh, supported more forces in Afghanistan, which is where Petraeus was, uh, and and it, they helped uh, him shore up some of his bona fides with Republicans on Capitol Hill, who by this point were starting to get uh, uh, get new doubts about the war in Afghanistan. I don't mind him playing a liaison role, but I wonder about this advisory role. Let's go to David Corner, who shares my views about this thing. 
It seems to me that you have a, a very interesting situation. I'm trying to think of a parallel, but I can't think of one, no. where people from the other ideological wing or spectrum of the country have found their way into a controlling situation on a war front. Well, what they had, well, you have these two think tankers. They're not in the military. American they're Enterprise, they're, senior they're, fellows. They're senior fellows. They burrow the, their way in. Neocons tend to be very good at burrowing. They burrow their way in, and they create, as Rajiv's wonderful piece you know, details, lots of confusion in the chain of command. People don't know how to relate to them. Are they spies for Petraeus? Are they, are they conveying orders from Petraeus? And, you know, it, it, how did this come to be? It gets to sort of the big issue that we talked about earlier this year, yeah. which is David Petraeus's judgment. Because he was so lionized and, you know, and almost worshipped as America's greatest general since Washington, yeah. he seemed to be able to feel he could get away with things. And he got into that scandal with Paula Broadwell, and then he's, he, this happens obviously before that, but okay. he feels he has the license to do things let's that go, other let's generals get, Let's couldn't. get to the heart of it. The surge strategy, which worked in Iraq, I'm told, people say it, that's conventional wisdom, applied then to Afghanistan. How were the Kagans involved with that, added, that whole strategy? Well, the Kagans pushed the surge strategy uh, in op-eds in, in my newspaper and other newspapers. Uh, they were they were, v were vocal proponents for it, and then uh, they were proponents for taking a much tougher line um, against uh, various Taliban factions. In fact, the irony here is that while David Petraeus was talking up a good game on counterinsurgency, on using troops to protect civilian populations in Afghanistan, what the Kagans were lobbying to do was to use more of those troops to conduct strikes against uh, uh, Taliban. Uh, of course, infiltration lines from Pakistan. Thank you. By hey, the you way, know, your Chris, story met the test. I mean, we'll do more on this later. We've got to go tonight, but I don't want to salute you, Raji, because your story met the test of Ben Bradley's. He said, I want to pick up the newspaper and say, holy, I can't use the word here, <laughs> holy. And when you say that, you know you got some. This story, I want everybody tonight to go back and look it up on Google or whatever else. Study this story. This is a story of penetration that ought to be understood. Rajiv, Rajiv Chandra Sekhar, and thank you much for joining us from the Washington Post. And David Korn, as always, we'll be right back. Uh, if Afghanistan can become the Central Asian roundabout, to use President Karzai's term, to where it can be the new Silk Road, uh, think of the uh, implications for that, Re recalling that, of course, Afghanistan uh, is blessed with the presence of what are trillions, with an S on the end, trillions of dollars worth of minerals, if and only if you can get the extractive technology, the human capital operated, the lines of communication to enable you to get it out of the country and all the rest of that. Very big if, and of course there's a foundation of security uh, that would be necessary on, on which to build all of that. But again, the prospects are very significant